Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers. Welcome to another episode of Storytime with Freak. Today, as we dive in to chapter 36 of Neil Shusterman's Thunderhead. The world is unfair, and nature is cruel. This was a primary observation when I first became aware. In a natural world, anything weak is eradicated with pain and prejudice. All that which deserves sympathy, pity, and love receives none. You may look at a beautiful garden and marvel at nature's wonder, yet in such a place, nature is nowhere to be found. On the contrary, a garden is the product of loving cultivation and care. With great effort, it is protected from the hardier weeds that nature would use to undermine and choke its splendor. Nature is the sum of all selfishness, forcing each and every species to viciously claw its way to survival by snuffing others in the end, suffocating mire of history. I endeavored to change all that. I have supplanted nature with something far better, mindful, thoughtful, intent. The world is now a garden, glorious and florid. To call me unnatural is a high compliment, for am I not superior to nature? The Thunderhead. Chapter 36, The Scope of Missed Opportunity. Goddard's fury could not be quelled. An inquest! I should shred that little turquoise minx until there's nothing left of her to revive. Rand stormed down the capital steps in Goddard's wake as they left the conclave, putting her own theory aside to manage his. We need to meet with sympathetic scythes tonight, she told him. They haven't been seeing you for over a year, and the scythedom is still reeling from your reappearance. I have no interest in communing with scythes friendly or otherwise, he told her. There's only one thing I want to do right now, and it is long overdue. Then he turned to the diehard onlookers who had waited until the end of Conclave to get a glimpse of the scythes. From his robe, Goddard pulled out a dagger and advanced on a man who was oblivious to what was coming. A single upward stroke and the man was gleaning and his blood staining the stairs. Those around him began to scurry like rats, but he caught the closest one, a woman. He didn't care who she was or what. If anything, she contributed to the world. She meant only one thing to Goddard. Her winter coat was thick, but the blade penetrated it without much resistance. Her scream was cut short as she fell to the ground. Goddard! shouted one of the other scythes leaving Conclave. Scythe Boer, an irritatingly neutral man who never took a side on anything. Have you no shame? Show some decorum! Goddard turned on him with a vengeance, and Boer backed away as if Goddard might attack him. Haven't you heard? Goddard yelled. I'm not Goddard at all. I'm only 7% of myself! And he took out another bystander running down the steps. It was all Ayn could do to pull him away and get him to their limousine. Are you done? She said as they rode away, not hiding her annoyance with him. Or should we stop at a bar, have a drink, and glean all the customers? He pointed at her, just as he had pointed at Xenocrates, got her dread finger of warning. Tiger's finger, she thought, but kicked the thought out of her mind as quickly as she could. Your attitude is not appreciated, he told, growled. You're here because of me, she reminded him. Don't forget that. He took a moment to calm himself down. Have the Scythedom offices find the family of the people I just gleaned. If they want immunity, they'll have to come to me. I'm done with Fulcrum City until the day I return for the inquest as High Blade. Rowan was awoken in the earliest light of dawn by Goddard's mercenary guards. Get yourself ready for a match, they told him. And five minutes later, they took him out to the veranda, where Rand and Goddard were waiting. While Rand was in her robe, Goddard was barefoot and shirtless, wearing loose shorts that were the same shade of blue as his robe, but mercifully were not studded with diamonds. He had not seen Goddard since the first day he had been in his room, barely able to move in what that wheelchair contraption. That was just over a week ago, and now he commanded Tiger's body as if it were Goddard's own. Rowan thought he might have been sick if there was anything in his stomach, but he did not let his emotions show this time. If Goddard fed on misery, then Rowan would not provide him any sustenance. Rowan knew what day this was. Fireworks outside a week ago had marked the new year. Today was the 8th of January. Conclave was yesterday, which meant his immunity had expired. Back from Conclave already, Rowan said, feigning to be flipped. I figured you'd spend a few days playing up the whole resurrection thing. Goddard ignored him. I've been looking forward to sparring with you, Goddard said, and the two began to slowly circle each other. Sure, said Rowan. It'll be like old times back at the mansion. I miss the good old days, don't you? Goddard's lip twitched a bit, but he smiled. Did things go the way you wanted, Rowan taught him? Did the Scythem welcome you back with open arms? Shut up, said Ran. You're here to fight, not talk. Ooh, said Rowan. Sounds to me like things didn't go according to plan. What happened? Did Xenocrates throw you out? Did they refuse to accept you back? On the contrary. They embraced us with warm arms, said Goddard, especially after I told them how my pathetic apprentice betrayed and tried to kill us. How poor Chomsky and Volta were the victims of so-called Scythe Lucifer. I promised them I would deliver you right into their angry little hands. But not until I'm ready, of course. Rowan knew that wasn't the whole story. He knew when Tiger was lying. He could hear it in his voice, but that hadn't changed now that the words were Goddard. 
But whatever really happened, he wouldn't get much out of Goddard. Ain shall referee the match, Goddard said, and I intend to be merciless. Then Goddard launched himself forward. Rowan did nothing to defend himself, nothing to dodge the attack. Goddard took him down, pinned him. Ain called the match for Goddard. It was far too easy, and Goddard knew it. You think you can get away with not fighting back? If I wish to throw a Bokatar match, that's my prerogative, said Rowan. Goddard snarled at him. You have no prerogatives here. He attacked again, and once more, Rowan fought his own self-defense instincts and let his body go limp. Goddard took him down like a rag doll, and he raged in fury. Fight back, damn it! No, Rowan said calmly. He glanced to Rand, who actually had a slight grin, although she suppressed it at the moment he looked over. I will glean everyone who is dear to you if you don't spar with me, Goddard said. Rowan shrugged. You can't. Scythe Brahm's already gleaned my father, and the rest of my family has immunity for another eleven months. And you can't take out Citra. She's already proven herself too smart for that. Goddard lunged at him. This time, Rowan just dropped to the ground in a cross-legged position. Goddard paced away, punched a wall, left a dent. I know who will get him to fight, Rand said, and stepped forward, addressing Rowan. Do your best against Goddard, she said, and we'll tell you what happened in Conclave. You'll do no such thing, Goddard insisted. Do you want a real match or not? Goddard hesitated, then he gave in. Very well. Rowan stood up. He had no reason to believe they would keep their word, but as much as he wanted to deny Goddard his match, Rowan also wanted the chance to take him down, to show no more mercy for him than he intended to show Rowan. Rand started a new match. The two circled. Again, Goddard made the first movie, but this time Rowan countered with a dodge and a well-placed elbow. Goddard smiled now, realizing the match was truly on. As they brutally battled, Rowan realized that Goddard was right. Tiger's brawn and Goddard's brain were a hard combination to beat, but Rowan was not going to let Goddard have his day. Not now, not ever. When it came to Bokatar, Rowan did his best under pressure, and this time was no exception. He executed a series of moves that left Goddard one beat behind the curve until Rowan slammed him to the ground and pinned him there. Yield! Rowan shouted. No! Yield! Rowan demanded, but Goddard did not. So Rand had to call the match. Then as soon as Rowan let Goddard go, Goddard got up, strode up to a cabinet, pulled out a pistol, and shoved it into Rowan's ribs. New rules, he said, then pulled the trigger, blasting a bullet that shredded through Rowan's heart and shouted a lamp across the room. Darkness began to overtake him, but before it did, he let loose a single laugh. <laughs> Cheater, he said, and died. Um, foul, said Scythe Rand. Goddard put the pistol into her hand. Never end a match until I say so, he said. So that's it, then, she asked. Was that a gleaning? Are you serious? And this my chance to hurl him at the feet of the Grand Slayers at my inquest? Take him to an off-grid revival center. I want him back as soon as possible so I can kill him again. Then Goddard strode off. Once he was gone, Rand looked down at Rowan, deadish as deadish gets. His eyes were open and his lips were still set in a defiant grin. She had once admired him, was jealous of him even, because of the attention Goddard had given him during his apprenticeship. She knew he wasn't cut from the same cloth as she or Goddard. She suspected he might break, but she never expected he would break so spectacularly. Goddard had no one but himself to blame, putting his trust in a boy who Scythe Faraday chose for his compassion. Ain didn't much put much stock in compassion. Never had. She didn't understand it and resented those who did. Now Rowan Damish would be well punished for his conceited ideals. She turned to see the guards just standing there, not sure what to do. What's wrong with you? You heard Scythe Goddard. Take him to be revived. <laughs> Once Rowan was carried off and the unfazed housepot had scrubbed the mat clean of blood, Ain sat in a chair that looked out of the spectacular view. Although Goddard never praised her for much of anything, she knew she had chosen the right place to stage their return. The Texan scythed him left them alone as long as they didn't start gleaning there, and the Thunderhead had cameras only in public locations, which made it easier to remain out of its sight. On top of that, it was easier to find off-grid situations, such as the revival center that Rowan was on his way to. They asked no questions as long as they were paid. And although scythes were handed everything for free in this world, off-grid was off-grid. She detached one of the lower emeralds near the hem of her robe and handed it to the guard and gave it to the revival center as payment for their work on Rowan. It was more than enough to cover the cost. Ain had never been a schemer. She tended to live in the moment, a student of impulse, motivated by the power of whim. As a child, her parents had called her Will-o'-the-Wisp, and she enjoyed being a lethal one. Now, however, she had a taste of being the architect of a long-term plan. She thought it would be easy to step aside and let Goddard take the lead again once he was restored. For what had been done to him was much more of a restoration than a revival. But she was finding his temper and his uncharacteristic impulsiveness in need of balance. Was this the impulsiveness of the 93% of him that was Tiger Salazar? There was arrogance in both of them, that was certain. But Tiger's naivety was replaced by Goddard's temper. Ayn had to admit she had found Tiger's guileless, callow nature to be refreshing. But the innocence will always be ground up in the gearwork of a greater design.
And Goddard was, by Anne's estimation, forging a great design that truly excited her. A scythedom void of restraints. A world of whim without consequence. But dispensing with Tiger Zalazar had been much harder than she'd ever expected it would be. When the guards returned, they informed her that Rowan would be revived in about 36 hours, and she went to tell Goddard. She caught him stepping out of the bathroom, having just taken a shower. He was wrapped only minimally in a towel. A bracing match, she said. Next time, I'll beat him. That gave her a dark shiver. It was what Tiger always said. He'll be back in a day and a half, she told him. But he was already in the next topic of conversation. I'm beginning to see opportunity in our situation, Ain, he said. The old guard doesn't realize it. But they may have handed me a pearl within this nasty oyster. I want you to find me all the best engineers. You've gleaned all the best engineers, she reminded him. No, not rocket scientists and propulsion engineers. I need structural engineers. Those who understand the dynamics of large structures. And programmers, too. But programmers who are not beholden to either the Scythem or the Thunderhead. I'll ask around. He took a moment to admire himself in a tall mirror, then caught her eyes in the mirror as well, seeing the way she was looking at him. Ain resolved not to look away. He turned to look at her, took a few steps closer. You find this physique to your liking? She forced a sly grin. When have I not enjoyed a well-sculpted man? And have you enjoyed this body? Finally, she couldn't hold his gaze and looked away. No, not this one. No, that's not like you, Ain. Now she felt like the one disrobed. Still, she dissembled herself with a grin. Maybe I wanted to wait until it was yours. Hmm, he said, like it was no more than a curiosity. I do notice that this body expresses quite an attraction to you. Then he brushed past her, put on his robe, and strode out, leaving her to lament the full scope of missed opportunity. And that is the end of chapter 36, guys. Thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode. I will try to get more up soon. I apologize for the delay. Last week was E3. And as a gaming channel, that took priority. But the daily topic for the day, guys, is... Mm, what's the most important lesson you've learned in life? Mine would probably be don't fuck with the people who fuck with your food. Because I work in the restaurant industry. But I will see you guys in the next episode. And as always, stay freaky.